tonight on UCSD Conversations. Explore how UCSD sports teams face the dual challenge of opportunity and fairness as federal law and gender equity go head to head on the athletic fields at UCSD. And go behind the scenes at the UCSD Winter Dance Concert with concert director Margaret Marshall. And later, meet UCSD's newest math professor, Efim Zelmanov, winner of the Fields Medal, mathematics equivalent of the Nobel Prize. But first, Dr. Ken Kashansky, Chair of the Department of Medicine, in conversation with Dr. Thomas Kipps about cutting-edge treatments for diseases such as leukemia. Hello, my name is Ken Kashansky. I'm the uh, Chairman of the Department of Medicine here at UC San Diego. It's my pleasure today to uh, talk with Dr. Thomas Kipps, who is also a professor of medicine in the uh, Department of Medicine. He is the uh, chief of our Division of Hematology Oncology and is an associate director of the Cancer Center. Today we're going to be talking about chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which is an area that Tom uh, has done a great deal of research in, and there's really some cutting-edge research that could very well translate into important advances in the treatment of this disease. Just for a little background, chronic lymphocytic leukemia is the most common leukemia of adults in the United States. Uh, there is a small uh, family risk of developing chronic lymphocytic leukemia. The disease is mostly characterized by a paradox. Chronic, as the name implies, chronic lymphocytic leukemia is a relatively slowly progressive leukemia although there are a number of patients who it takes a very aggressive course in. The paradox comes since this is a relatively slow growing disease, but as far as we know, it's not curable. In contrast to other forms of leukemia that are much more aggressive, but are in fact curable by modern methods. Some of the research that Tom has been doing into chronic lymphocytic leukemia will hopefully shed some new light on how this disease grows and how we might develop new therapies to hopefully cure the disease, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. It's always been assumed that a better understanding of how a disease works will allow us to devise new therapies that will be successful. And so some of Tom's work has involved understanding how CLL works. So I'd ask you, Tom, uh, how does CLL grow, and does that allow us to learn new insights on, on the disease? Well, it's a very important question, and as you mentioned, the leukemia still is incurable by current uh, treatments. And this is probably uh, similar to many other types of cancer. And I think it's probably more analogous to many forms of cancer where there may be very slow growth and the tumor may evolve over time. And I uh, believe that the treatments that we've incorporated for this and other types of cancers have failed to take advantage of some of the newer knowledge that's being gained and how these tumor cells interact with the cells of the body, and how the immune system may be incorporated to develop ways to try and eradicate the tumor. We have done some work, and one of the advantages of leukemia uh, research is that we can isolate the cells easily by just taking a simple blood sample. And so this gives us an opportunity to examine how the cells behave in uh, the laboratory. And one of the striking features here is that uh, the tumor cells oftentimes uh, are found not to be uh, able to survive very well in isolation. In other words, they require signals from other cells in the body. And uh, these cells may provide some form of a support structure. Uh, and the leukemia cells perhaps uh, elicit the help of some of these normal cells for their uh, continued growth and survival. And I think understanding the dynamics of that interaction may be very important because we may be able to devise targets that interfere with that communication that would allow the leukemia cell to be less protected by these normal cells. In addition, uh, the leukemia, similar to other types of cancers, are really caused by changes in the DNA. We know that cancer is a genetic disease caused by mutation in genes that really control the growth and survival of normal cells. But the leukemia and cancers in general oftentimes are more similar to the normal cells from which they are derived than they are dissimilar. So they share a number of the same features and we can compare the normal cells with the leukemia cells and gain insight into what went awry with these uh, tumor cells. And I think some of this is very important because it can provide us with clues as 
to targets for intervention as well. Uh, you may have a mutation in the gene that's very important for the growth of the leukemia, and by using a drug that can interfere with the altered protein, for example, we can gain uh, a therapeutic advantage against the leukemia. This has been done for another type of leukemia, chronic myelogenous leukemia, with the recent discovery of a drug Gleevec. Uh, and the drug Gleevec has been an important advance because this drug takes advantage of the knowledge of some of the genetic changes in the leukemia cell that give rise to a growth advantage in the leukemia cell. And the drug inter interacts with the mutated protein and causes those leukemia cells to undergo growth arrest. We don't have the knowledge of a defined genetic lesion within chronic lymphocytic leukemia, but we have several clues that we're looking at now, and these may provide important targets that we can try and define new drugs to interfere in a similar fashion as done with Gleevec. I think the other aspect with the uh, leukemia and tumors in general is that because these cells do arise from mutation in the genes that control growth and survival of cells, we have also the knowledge that these genes encode altered proteins. They're not like the proteins that we have in our normal cells. And similar to alterations in cells that might be caused by virus infection, for example, it's possible that the immune system can recognize the alteration in the leukemia by targeting some of these altered proteins that, under, uh, that are resulting from the mutation in the cells. Uh, I want to go back to something you said earlier, which is quite interesting, this interaction between the leukemia and, and the, the host, if, if you will. And what is it that supports these leukemic cells in the body that doesn't occur in, in the test tube that, that allows these cells to die. I understand that some of your work has revolved around understanding specialized cells that have uh, these properties to support these leukemic cells. You want to ex tell me something about that? Well, it was quite surprising. We, um, one of the uh, postdoctoral fellows in the laboratory was doing a series of experiments and just looking at how well these leukemia cells can survive in the laboratory. And what he observed was that if he isolated the leukemia cells and to a pure population, uh, they had a very short survival. But when he just cultured them with uh, other blood cells, you could see growing out of the culture cells which we call nurse-like cells because of their properties. And the leukemia cells will home to them like honeys to a hive. And they will stay there and they will be nurtured by these nurse-like cells. And if you allow this interaction to continue in the laboratory, these leukemia cells can survive for weeks, if not months, without dying. Uh, they don't uh, grow very quickly, but they sustain themselves. If you take them away from these cells, they start to undergo death within a matter of hours. And so it's interesting, if we interfere with the signals that are responsible for homing these cells to these nurse-like cells, then we have a means of killing the cell indirectly through neglect. And this is something we hope to achieve by new therapeutics, which are a different mechanism. It's not a direct effect against the leukemia, but interfering with the communication that allows them to survive for prolonged times in the body. The, these nurse cells are pretty interesting, and my understanding is they don't normally exist. They're only there for the CLL, so perhaps doing away with them would not do any harm and perhaps get rid of the side effects of standard kinds of therapy. I think these nurse-like cells, like the tumor cells, probably differentiate or mature from normal cells which are there. And it's almost insidious to think of a tumor conscripting normal cells to help sustain them. And they appear to be a differentiated type of cell which is distinct from other cells which you normally have in the body. And one aspect that we've come to appreciate recently is the chronic nature of this leukemia, as you mentioned. Namely, the disease seems to grow very slowly over time. And one of the interesting aspects of that analysis is that maybe the leukemia is actually growing faster than we observe in the patient, but it has to support the scaffolding, which allows for a larger population of leukemic cells to survive. And it may be the outgrowth of the scaffolding of support cells, which allows for the tumor burden to increase over time. So you're right, if we're able to attack the scaffolding, against the uh, cells which sustain the leukemia, it might be another therapeutic target. I'd like to also expand on um, another thing that you mentioned earlier, that of the immune system. 
the genetic changes in CLL are becoming better understood. Uh, as we know that in patients with AIDS, with HIV infection, that uh, if you lose your immune system, you're susceptible to all sorts of infections and cancers as well. Uh, is there something going on with CLL that allows it to evade the immune system? Normally, as we know, the immune system is really vital in making certain that we don't develop tumors uh, or that if tumors develop, it sops them up. Uh, is there something about CLL that evades the immune system that we might take advantage of? Well, I think that's true, and I think it's not just unique to this leukemia, but probably to tumors in general. As I mentioned before, the tumors may arise through mutation in these important genes that uh, encode proteins that are responsible for the growth or survival of normal cells. And we do know that the immune system might be able to recognize those alterations. If you think about the problem that, say, a tumor cell might have, if it has an ability to be recognized and be rejected by the immune system, it may never come to our attention. So only those tumor cells that have been able to evade the immune system and grow are the ones that we actually can see clinically. So I would say that most tumor cells have at least been selected for their ability to evade the immune system. Now we do know with this leukemia, it gets even worse in that these leukemia cells are derived from cells which are part of the immune system. And ordinarily they interact with other cells of the immune system in making such proteins as antibodies, which are very important in fighting infectious disease. And because they are able to interact with the cells, they may understand the language of how they communicate with the other cells of the immune system, and they can provide the right type of language which can turn the immune system off. And I think that's a very important aspect here as we understand how the language is to turn off the immune response selectively it's very important because we can try to reverse that to gain a therapeutic strategy against this leukemia. But also, I think, on the other hand, if you think about it, if we understand that language very well, we may have potential clues for how to treat patients who have autoimmune disease where we want the immune system to settle down and to be more quiet. Ideas about how do we make the CLL cells more recognizable to the immune system so that our own bodies help eliminate the tumor. It's not just an oncologist giving a, a medication that eliminates the tumor, it's your own body that eliminates the tumor. Ideas about how to well, we have turn actually up that visibility? seen this. There are certain uh, signals that we can give to the leukemia cell that causes it to do a role reversal. And some of these signals are pulling levers on the surface of the leukemia cell that causes it to stop evading the immune system and stop being like a stealth bomber and to start being like a cheerleader, uh, sending out semaphores and eliciting immune attention. Uh, one of these proteins we know is the protein CD40 ligand, and that's ordinarily expressed for a very short time during the course of the immune response. And this protein is somewhat like a light switch, which is turned on for a very short time and then turned off, and we know it's critical for turning on the immune response. We know that this protein appears to be in short supply in patients with this disease. And so one strategy that we have incorporated is to use genetic transfer to get the gene that encodes this protein into the leukemia cells themselves. And we've been able to do this by taking a gene and putting it into the cells after we've taken the leukemia cells outside of the body. We modify the leukemia cells and now we make them from one that can evade immune function to one that acts more like a vaccine. And this has really been the basis for uh, gene therapy trials, which we have uh, really pioneered here at UCSD. Um, we've incorporated a phase one trial and now have a phase two trial in the works, where patients are having their leukemia cells harvested, they're modified in a specialized suite, which is somewhat like an operating room. The gene is introduced into the leukemia cells, and these cells become very active in being able to stimulate immune function. Those cells are then given back as a vaccine to see if we can elicit immune uh, destruction of the leukemia cells within the patients. Both of those approaches, the nurse cells and the gene therapy for triggering the immune response are, are highly innovative and, and potentially novel and hopefully curative. Uh, there have been a, a number of events in the last uh, few years, uh, new therapies on the market that have been tested in CLL. And in the last few minutes, I'd 
I'd like to get your thoughts on how therapies that are already available to us uh, might be combined uh, to enhance our ability to deal with CLL. Well, that's a very important question because it's a very exciting time now. We are incorporating uh, mechanisms of action that we talked about just now, but also we have new agents such as monoclonal antibodies. These antibodies can be directed against proteins on the tumor cell surface and be used to clear the tumor cells from the body. And we have actually a few monoclonal antibodies that are approved for use, and we have new protocols investigating new antibodies which can target this leukemia. And we have actually some very uh, exciting results currently in the clinic where we've been able to take these monoclonal antibodies and combine them with other agents, for example, agents that might interfere with the ability of the leukemia cell to effectively interact with the nurse-like cell, and it appears that it makes these monoclonal antibodies even more effective in being able to fight down the tumor cells to get complete remissions in some of the patients who have been treated with these new protocols. So I, I, I guess this follows up on the general theme in leukemia and cancer uh, therapy that if you combine agents that work in different ways, you're probably going to be a lot more successful at treating the leukemia than if you just use one or, or another uh, approach. And I think what's very exciting now is that we are now trying to combine agents where we have more knowledge of the mechanism of action and so we can interfere at multiple levels on the tumor cell biology to devise strategies that seem to work together and more effectively to actually try and achieve a cure for patients with this disease. I think one of the most exciting aspects of this uh, field is the newness of it all. Uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia was sort of uh, relegated to sort of secondhand status for many, many years. Patients uh, tended to do well for many years and it didn't command a lot of attention. Now we understand more about the fundamental biology of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. We know more about how it works, how it grows, uh, and it provides new ideas about how to intervene uh, in the process. One of the uh, exciting things here at UC San Diego is bringing all of this together, uh, sort of the soups to nut approach of uh, leukemia therapy, understanding the basic biology, creating new innovative therapies, combining available therapies into a, a, a program that will uh, attack, attack the leukemia. Any final thoughts on where this field is heading and uh, where the excitement lies and uh, where we can expect treatment for chronic lymphocytic leukemia to be in a couple of years? Well, I'm hopeful that we can actually nail down a cure for this disease in the, in the very near term, and we're working hard to develop that. But I think as we gain knowledge of this leukemia, we'll have clues for other types of tumors, solid tumors, which may be more common, but have maybe similar features and similar problems in terms of devising therapeutic cure treatments that can actually be curative. Certainly, uh, we all appreciate the, the work that we need to do in patients with lung cancer and colon cancer, breast cancer, uh, but it's very hopeful to think that well, our understanding of cancers such as leukemias might provide new insights into those other more common cancers uh, that will have a major effect on, on the health of, of patients with these very unfortunate malignancies. And I think there's evolving work that shows that to be the case and that even tumors such as breast cancers and lung cancers may involve interactions again with normal cells which were critical for sustaining their survival. So with that thought uh, of the hope for the future, uh, I'll say thank you Tom for uh, chatting with me today. Well thank you Ken. And uh, look forward to our next conversation. Well thank you. Coming up later on UCSD Conversations, a look at the UCSD Winter Dance Concert and UCSD's newest math professor. But now, federal law and gender equity meet on the fields of play at UCSD. Title IX depends on who you talk to. It can be a very complex law. But um, the reality is, I mean, it is a federal law, and clearly it states that you should be providing uh, any institution that receives federal monies should be providing equal opportunities for both boys and girls or men and women uh, 
And it's not, it's been painted as a athletic issue because of the visibility at the Division I level, but the reality is it's, it's a federal law for all programming, all educational programming or activities. It came out in 1972, and 30 years later, we're still discussing on what does this really mean. And there's been a lot of discussion lately on, gosh, Title IX needs to go away because it's, uh, it's done all these terrible things. But the reality is, is we still have a long ways to go as far as uh, equal equity uh, treatments for females and girls in sports. However, the three-pronged test is uh, something that uh, it has been out there. It's public information. It's certainly what universities use. And quite simply, it's broken into three parts. And prong one is the, what you would hear people talk about as far as proportionality. And basically what that is saying is, okay, if you're going to have a sports program, that the number of opportunities for your women should match up to the number of undergraduate enrolled students that you have. Prong two is uh, the ability for an institution to demonstrate that they have continued to expand programs for women, that they've added sport programs. And that usually is a five to a seven year window where you can actually say that we have added programs. The third prong is definitely assessing through interest surveys um, the ability to prove that you have met the abilities and interests of uh, the underrepresented class, which would be the female student athlete here. I think that they should be equally funded because, I mean, we're both out there given the same amount of time and, you know, doing the same thing. So we should be, you know, given the same amount of money to do what we want to do. Well, athletics is impacted you know every part of my life in terms of how I approach my classes how I approach my future goals it's given me a lot of confidence and it's also taken off like the pressures that I think a lot of other women feel from society in terms of um, how they look and how they're supposed to act and maybe in terms of discrimination and stuff because I've never I'm lucky I've never felt discrimination because I've always been a part of athletics where the coaches were very supportive of female athletes the law is simple but implementing the law is where it becomes very complex so one of the implementation or what most institutions are doing in order to stay in compliance with uh, prong one is what we call roster management. And that's something that most male coaches would be concerned about because, and male coaches and administrators because we don't like it either, okay? We don't like the, the fact that, that uh, we have to limit uh, the number of opportunities for student athletes to participate. What is happening is because we're now going to a roster management situation where the women's team and the men's team in basketball need to have equal amount of participants. To me, that's okay, but the problem philosophically is we're keeping some men who just want to be part of the experience and participate in a program. They're not being allowed to because there's not enough women that want to. It's not like we're saying the women can't and the men can. The women don't want to. They're choosing to not participate. And so if they have 16, we have to have 16 even though we could keep 25 because we have men that want to participate and the women don't. Having grown up in the era where women had to fight for every little inch on the athletic field or every little bit of, of progress, uh, Title IX was like a godsend. It was like, oh, finally, uh, we'll get some you know, chance to, to be successful, to succeed in a, in a different arena. And women were succeeding long before that. They just didn't have the resources that the guys do. And now they have the resources and now you can see the effect when it comes down to it, I'm having an awesome experience. I feel fortunate to be here. I'm lucky to be here for the academics. And it's a, just another plus to be able to play on the tennis team. Basically, Title IX itself, anytime you have, like I said, a government edict uh, that's a bureaucratic piece of legislation, you're really putting administrators and coaches in a bind where if they're not able to use common sense to apply the guidelines that they're being given. If you're going to tell me that every single situation in every school in America is blanket this, blanket that, that's ridiculous. You know, and I think that um, that's what they're trying to, where they're trying to apply the rule of Title IX. And I'm not sure that that was the intent. I mean, I, I think that the intent was needed. I think that it was something that served its purpose. And now I think it needs to be looked at and restructured only in a way that each institution can hopefully be, they will, they'll, take to the law of Title IX, they'll be fair, and they'll do what they're supposed to do. At UCSD, I think we've done that. And I'm not sure that it is fair that, in our case, we have guys that can't participate in men's basketball that would like to because women's basketball players don't want to. It seems like there are more, a lot more men who would like to be on the cross-country team than there are women who would like to. And so, and so to keep the numbers of men lower to fit you know, a 2% difference in student body um, percentages between men and women seems 
you know, it, I have a problem with that. I have a problem because it does seem that you're cutting off opportunity from men in order to portray the idea that men and women have equal opportunity here. But to me, as an athlete, that translates as four people not being able to be on a team that they should probably be able to be on. The Secretary of Education under the Bush administration formulated the 15-person commission that hosted four town meetings across the country this past year. And one discussion is looking at equal being 50-50 is usually how you would look at equality, but now they're, they're looking at regardless of enrollments, because it comes back to prong one, regardless, if your female enrollment was 65%, uh, we're still going to cap you as only having to have 50% opportunities for women. And we're going to give you a range of anywhere from 2 to 5%, so really wouldn't even need to, uh, up to 7%, actually. So it wouldn't really even need to be 50%, it would be 43%. So 43% of the opportunities when your enrollment is 65%. So that's one of the uh, proposals that are out there. If you have, as a lot of schools are going to, a majority women, shouldn't the opportunities for women be more because there are more women in the institution? Why should uh, men have more opportunities when there's more women at a school? Why? I don't think that that's relevant to anything for the main reason is that now we're talking about students, not student athletes. And I think that maybe more women choose to go to college than men. Title IX was about opportunity. And once we have opened those doors of opportunity, if someone doesn't want to walk through that door, that's their choice. It's not being closed on them. You know, they have the opportunity, they just don't want it. Schools that have men's football want to have 200 people on the roster, 200 guys on the roster. And they don't want to have to balance that. They don't want to have to, to give up any of that, uh, any of those guys, because if they give them up, then some other school is going to get them. And so they, could, they only get scholarships for 85 but they still have 200 kids on the roster. Well, if they gave up 15 scholarships, they could fund the sports that have been eliminated, like men's wrestling and men's volleyball. Wrestling programs are being axed, and they're being axed under the guide of Title IX. And the reality is it's a budgetary decision being made, and the athletic directors are saying, sorry, we're cutting your sport because we have to fund football, we have to fund these other sports. My own personal feeling is that football is an entirely different sport, so let's remove football from the equation and just say football is its own entity. It's football. Let's not apply Title IX to that. Let's apply Title IX to the rest of the athletic department. I'm not sure that at most of those schools that football should have their own athletic department just for football, and they should be separate of the, the rest of the intercollegiate, because it's not, it's a business. I mean, it's not really intercollegiate athletics. It's a business. Well, at UCSD, obviously, we don't have a football program, and that can be a plus and it can be a minus. There's just a lot of things that we need to put in place before we would have the resources, both the uh, facilities and the human resources to be able to manage su such a task as uh, bringing on a football program. The fact that that there are many schools across the country that uh, do not have football and some programs over the last 10 years that have dropped football because it wasn't this money maker that people think. You know, I'm at a school that doesn't have a football team and our basketball team isn't exactly a huge <laughs> revenue generating team so I would say that I don't think they should be exempt from Title IX um, rules and regulations because either way it is, they are opportunities for men and so to completely exclude it would almost be admitting that, oh, these are on a higher wavelength you know, on a, on a whole different, you know, level than the rest of the sports. And so you guys will be down here, and since these are such great sports, then we're going to give them special attention. They're not even going to be subjected to the rules. And I think I have a problem with that, because I think that that's, in essence, saying, well, that's not equal opportunity. Like, we're making really great efforts to give you equal opportunity, minus these two huge sports. Unfortunately, I think there, there still needs to be laws regarding this, because I don't think it would have happened way back in the 70s if we hadn't had the law. And I just, just with everything, I think there just needs to be laws so that the schools are, are held accountable, there's rules mandated, and um, you know, some people aren't gonna like the laws and it's gonna be hard to, to sometimes enforce them, but I think um, it still needs, there still needs to be a federal law regarding this. Anything worthwhile is gonna take time and it's gonna be a struggle. And so I think we should just keep fighting through it and women should keep prevailing and going out there and practicing and doing awesome things. Coming up later on Conversations, math professor and Fields medalist, Afim Zelmanov.
But now, go behind the scenes at the Winter Dance Concert with concert director Margaret Marshall. It's so important to make someone happy. The Winter Dance Concert is a chance for our students in the theater and dance department to be involved in the creative process of new works choreographed by members of our dance faculty or guest artists, culminating in a week of performances in front of a live audience. The concert this year features seven pieces ranging from hip-hop to ballet and incorporating many of the styles and disciplines that we have in dance offered through our curriculum. The number that I choreographed for this year is called Timeless Love. It's about a group of dancers that are practicing a ballet scene in a variety theater in the 1940s. You're, you're like, you're all like older than you are now, so you have to act older. You have to look older because you all look too young. You look innocent. You're not innocent. And the impresario comes in and he has like um, his nephew that just got back from the war um, and he's an officer. And he brings him to the ballet because he's going out with one of the stars and, you know, one of the dancers. And, and you know, I teach the history of dance and in those days, dancers were kind of thought of as loose. Some, you know, some of them were very hard workers, but some of them would go out with men of money. And so it seems like this impresario, though, has been out with an awful lot of the cast at this theater. In fact, probably the impresario has had every single one of you on a date, if not in bed, okay? <laughs> he comes in to introduce his nephew, and the nephew doesn't take to the stars in the theater, he takes to the wardrobe mistress, who's the younger girl, and they just fall in love for sight. And so the impresario takes him out to the park afterwards and he danced with some of the dancers. And the wardrobe mistress and her friend walk in to the park and they, you know, they get attracted and the other girl always has wanted to date the impresario anyway, so she goes with the impresario and things change. And then the dream scene happens and in that it's really in, um, the officer's mind that this is the first when he saw her that this is how he, she affected him and I wanted to have for, sort of a feministic view about this that the woman was involved in love so I made Megan very strong you know and, and very um, forward and, and, and yet at the same time shy because she wasn't quite sure of herself so the dream scene really tells the love story So then we went into the coffee, um, jazz sort of, you know, cafe, um, and they were like three o'clock in the morning, they're tired and exhausted. And then I wanted to go straight to Starbucks, you know, and nowadays, present day. And um, the hardest part is getting them changed and into their wigs and stuff so that they look 60 years later. the dancers to come up with characters. So they came up with these ideas of um, somebody with like a lot of books and some sports enthusiasts. I thought, well, we'll have a businesswoman, definitely, you know, on the phone, in a suit. And then I was over pulling costumes and I saw these different pregnancy 
you know, possibilities. And I said, I think I'm going to make one of the girls pregnant. And then, so they started to walk on when we got in the theater, and I realized all of those people are loved by somebody. Because, you know, Jimmy Durante singing that song, you know, make somebody happy. And here's this woman who's going to have a baby, the ballerina who's so in love with, you know, the ballet, and this nerd's in love with books, and the businesswoman is in love with her, you know, career. And these guys are in love with sports. You know, I mean, it just turned out so well. It was really a good background scene. I just had them come on in these walkers and 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 I know that you know I've seen some of these walkers and they have horns and they have little artificial flowers and they have the purses hanging off and any kind of little there it's their personal car you know so we tried to personalize that and then I said I want you to play with this every night and of course some of the things they came up with in rehearsal weren't <laughs> allowed to go on stage <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's starting to look like something. It's the audience point of view of whether they didn't see each other after that little tryst in that year or something. Maybe he went off to war and maybe, you know, they've, you know, I don't know. Maybe they have been married all that time, but maybe they didn't see each other until that day on the street in front of the same cafe that they met 60 years ago. I kind of want that, either that they're so attracted to each other they can't wait to see each other, or they haven't seen each other in 60 years. So I will leave that up to the audience. <laughs> you know, we were playing with different endings. And I said, um, you know, I, I'm not getting this, you know, the Parkinson's is not enough. I need your facial expression. She goes, okay, I'm sticking my tongue out then. I said, okay. <laughs> One of my leads is my daughter. I'm very proud of her. I'm glad she chose UCSD. She did have a choice. Um, she's been in dance studios since she was a baby, and she's fun, and she's, she's, um, she's befriended herself with the other people, too, and the other faculty members. So I really try to take a distance, but it's, it's been really a blessing, too. It's just really been fun to have her. Find her. Yeah, it's like pretty much right when we looked at each other. Yeah, yeah. I used to be very articulate, and actually that cuts the creative process. I don't know how to explain this. When you, when you think of something and then you say, okay, this is it. I'm going to go into rehearsal and we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and this is the movement, you know, that I want you to learn, and, and it's going to go here, and it's going to start at the music, and the more you work, Every year you find out that it's, like it's good that. to okay. be okay. flexible. Or to go to like the set designer and the lighting designer and say, I don't know what's going on here, I need your help. Okay. You know, what, what ideas do you have here for a set? Yeah, because yeah. the lights I have form are between that tape line and here. <laughs> I picture this slot. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Oh, yeah, all right. Okay, cool. Like I told Patrick, I said, what ideas do you have to make it, you know, can I get a Starbucks thing? He goes, no, we can't get a Starbucks. <laughs> oh shoot, you know, so, so he was going to play with the neon, but the neon seemed to work for the 40s. And he just went out. I didn't see that set till we went in. Oh wow, look at that. That's cool, Patrick. And it came down from the sky there. And it dropped in. He says, well, what do you think? I mean, we had talked about it and he showed me renderings, you know, of the sketches. And I said, this is perfect. Okay, guys, I'm just going to listen to the end of the sound cue so I can hopefully get an idea of where it needs to go. So, Amir, if you could just sort of mark what you would be doing. The stage manager is also a graduate student, and um, she came into it after two or three weeks of the process. Sound go. Is she always going to hit his butt? Because that's a good cue for me. Yeah, I like that. So it's just, it's wonderful to work with these graduate students. They're so talented, and it really helps to have that artistic team. Just flash capes for the impresarians. Ooh. That's an idea. We can play with it, cape, yeah. 
dance is like a family, you know, I mean, you get so close to these students, and I really think that's why some of the students here at UCSD come to the dance program, why the dance program remains to be popular, because they feel that artistic freedom in them when they dance, you feel like nothing else in the, in the world. That feeling of performing and jumping and flying and, and just doing something to music is an expression that they have to have in their life. So that's why they still gravitate towards it in a college situation, even though they're not going to be professional dancers or will have it only partly in their life, or they will be professional dancers, or they will be professional actors. And Amir is a, a double major in theater and dance, so he's going to graduate this year and be out there and be popular, uh, And because we need men in dance, but he can lift, he can act, he can sing, he speaks like five languages. I mean, you know, he's, he's a multi-talented person, but he came to UCSD, I think, as either pre-med or his dad's a lawyer. So, you know, he was either going to be in law or, you know, medicine. And he turned out to be um, an artist. And that's why you do it. You do it to express yourself and then you hope that the audience gets it and then for the dancers to enjoy it as well and to feel proud along with you then that's just more icing on the cake it's the students that that's why I'm here they're just wonderful I feel like I have you know I've had a bigger family than than I do they're all my kids <laughs> Finally tonight, UCSD's Jeff Remmel with Fields medalist, Afim Zelmanoff. Welcome. My name is Jeff Remmel. I'm the Associate Dean of Physical Sciences, and I'm a professor of mathematics. And we're here today to talk to Afim Zelmanoff, who is a recent recruit at UCSD. And one of the reasons that we're so excited to have Afim here is that he is one of the few people who won the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in Mathematics, which is the Fields Medal. The Fields Medal is something that is offered every four years at the International Congress of Mathematicians. Every four years, either two to four people win the Fields Medal, and this is considered the highest honor in mathematics. Uh, it's one of the most difficult prizes to win, and moreover, you have to be under 40 to win it. He started out his career in Novosibirsk. He got his PhD in 1980. Uh, in Novosibirsk, which is in the middle of Siberia. Uh, it's a major research uh, center at the time uh, in mathematics and science in general. Uh, and we uh, are particularly fortunate to be sitting here in an office which has had three other Fields medalists. Uh, it has the highest density of Fields medalists for, <laughs> for square meter. <laughs> That's right. Since 1960, there's only been 36 Fields medalists, and we've been fortunate enough to have three of those. Uh, one was S.T. Yao, one was Mike Friedman, and the third one is Efim Zelmanov, who we're talking to today. And in fact, this, uh, they all had the same office. Unfortunately, two of them are now gone, but we're very happy to have Efim here at this time. Well, I'm very proud to be in this office. You were somebody who made, you know, who obviously made a major impact at a very young age for mathematicians. And even your thesis was a, made a major impact in the field of algebra. Um, when, when did you first, as, as, as a youth, realize that you had real mathematical talent? And how did that get developed in, this, in your school system? Well, maybe in, in the fifth grade, when I was 12, I decided that I want to be a mathematician. And the reason was that I had a very good school teacher. Well, she wasn't much of a mathematician, but she was so enthusiastic <laughs> and such a nice teacher. <laughs> I think that played the major role. It's very important to have a good teacher. Yes. And then how did the system, how did you, how did you go to university? Was there competitions to go to Oh, the yes. Uh, there was a good system of school Olympiads. You know, all school children in the Soviet Union could participate in Olympiads, first on the district level, then on the regional level, and so on. So that's what I did, and, well, if you are 
relatively successful, that's, a, that's an indication that maybe you can continue. I was also fortunate that there was a good university in Novosibirsk, maybe the third in the country. You, you mentioned that, that you first decided you wanted to be a mathematician in, in, in sort of fifth grade when you were about 12 years old. And, and what was it that excited you at the time? What, what, what was it that attracted you to the subject? Well, it's very difficult to explain the beauty, and I don't have to explain it to you, of course, <laughs> but <laughs> the beauty of a mathematical proof. You just see it and you feel that it is beautiful. Uh, also, I think that what is mathematical ability? In a way, it is an ability to think for a very long time about one problem. And sometimes you think about a problem and, and you know, things that you never imagined that were true about a particular situation, all of a sudden you see some pattern that you just... You know, for me, mathematics was at that stage, and largely at this stage too, is an art. Yes, yes. Of course, it is very pleasant that it has so many applications. It's very nice. And in a way, this applied side is also beautiful. In terms of your development, one of the things that, that we know when we, we recruit uh, Russian students is they're exceptionally well trained. Yeah, but the system is different and it's a bit unfair to compare Russian undergraduates, in general European undergraduates, with American undergraduates because in a way they start graduate school, um, well at the age of 19 maybe. Uh, here uh, People, they go to a college and they're still undecided about what they want yes. to be. Then they have to decide at 17. So at 17 I decided that I want to be a mathematician and all my courses were courses in mathematics. It's interesting from the point of view, I think, you know, how do, how do mathematicians pick their problems? What is it that, that sort of motivates you? Um, obviously, one of the things that you did um, which you're most famous for is to solve the something called the restricted Burnside problem. This is a problem in group theory, and for those people who don't know anything about groups, I, I have this one prop here for you, which is the, the famous Rubik's Cube, and you can think of this as a, a model of a group because you can think, as you twist this, you get various positions, and you can think of the various twists as sort of generators, if you like, of, of how the, you get the positions. And one of the early problems back, this goes back to 1902 when Bernstein uh, formulated the problem, is he said, well, suppose I, I have a group with only finitely many generators. In this case, this has only finitely many generators because there's only finitely many twists that you can do. You can think of the positions that you can get out of this cube as being generated by these, these sort of quarter turns. And if you think of it that way, then you then there's various moves that will take you, if you do various quarter turns in a certain order, that will take you back to the same position you started with. This is called the order of, of, of a move, if you like. And the question of Burnside was, well, suppose that you have a group with only finitely many generators, and you know that there is a, if you do any move for n steps, you get back to the same position that you got. The problem of whether there's a biggest finite group for every d and n is called the restricted Burnside problem, and this is something that you solved in 1991. This is a problem that, that many mathematicians would just be afraid to attack, because obviously many people spent lifetimes just trying to understand this thing. And so what is it, what was it that motivated you to do this problem, and, and why did you decide to pick this particular problem? Well, it's a very good question. Indeed, well, you know, initially I heard about this problem from, from my first years at the university. It was popular in the Soviet Union. But I didn't start to attack it. First I started to build an infrastructure, you know, to, to work on related questions that uh, possibly might be helpful, and then it was indeed a big decision that maybe I have a chance. <laughs> because, you know, there are these very clever people who worked on it. Yes. Uh, why, should, <laughs> why should I solve it? <laughs> maybe it's because I approached it from a different side. Maybe I knew something that they did not know 60 years ago. But uh, initially, it took some persuasion. I had to persuade myself that, yes, actually, I do have a chance. 
You know, like chess players, they look at the board and they even don't see how to win, but they can say which side has a winning position. Yes. So I thought and I thought I might win. How long did that process take you in terms of well, once you decided that you got the sort of right approach? The final storm maybe took about two, a year and a half. And that was very exhausting. Uh, when you, the storm is when you think about it all the time. Right. Basically 24 hours. You wake up in the night and still think about it. <laughs> and then it better converge in a year or a year and a half because you know, it couldn't go on infinitely, <laughs> indefinitely. That's often the case that, you, you know, mathematicians find that, that that's the experience, that at some point you just get completely absorbed in the problem. Yes. And sometimes to the point of exhaustion. Exactly. Right, and you just can't do anything <laughs> anymore. But in your case, that's actually fairly, that's very rapid actually to solve such a major well, problem. but everything was prepared. And then when I finally understood that basically it is done, I didn't feel anything, I felt empty. That's it. <laughs> Only empty. <laughs> People aren't very familiar with the Fields Medal and the, and the ceremonies and all that sort of stuff. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about you know, how you first learned that you were going to be one of the people that well, were going to be awarded. Well, you know, the decision was taken in Paris, I guess. And at that time I was in Madison. But for people in Paris, maybe Madison, Michigan, they sound the same. <laughs> so they sent a letter to Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> so I never heard about it. I was the last one to learn about it. And what was the ceremony like for you in terms of, there were, there were three other people who won it that year, Yes, right? very, I was very nervous, naturally. And of course you had to give a talk at this, at this, at this course. I assume you, that, yes. was, that was okay, right? I mean, yes, there was a press conference when I had to explain what is a group. Well, I didn't do it as well as you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that's happened just in recent years is we have the, something called the Clay Prizes. There's seven, seven problems that people have come up with. They said if you could solve one of these problems, you get a million dollars. So if anybody wants to get rich quick, you know. Uh, I don't uh, think this is the quickest way to get rich. <laughs> but, <laughs> but. So how is it that you actually came to the United States? Well, first time I came to the United States in 89. Well, then that's when it became possible. Right. The Iron Curtain fell and it was that fall. Uh, my first place was Yale University and during that fall I gave talks at 15 universities wow. in the United States. So what was your initial impression of the United States in terms of you know, what you led to believe the United States was about? The strongest impression was you know, how inclusive the place is. In a way, I came from Russia, there were people from, you know, Belgium, England, China, and everybody felt at home. Right. Nobody felt a guest. And that was amazing, because I came from Russia, from the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, I happened to be of Jewish origin, and that was a very big issue there. Right. In America, it wasn't an issue at all. I could smell it. If you talk to officials in the Soviet Union, they would explain to you that they, it also wasn't an issue. It was. There's a, a beauty in mathematics that, that motivates us all, and I assume that that's the same for you, right? Absolutely. That, that somehow ex explaining these kinds of ideas to students and to your colleagues and communicating them is really, is really the greatest joy. And one of the things that you're known for is being you know, a great lecturer, and I've heard you give lectures. And Sometimes you feel about some things that they're beautiful, and students very often tend to share your attitude. <laughs> In terms of, of your um, vision of, of your role within the university, I mean, how, how do you balance things like teaching and, and research? And I like to teach. Uh, I don't mind it at all, and uh, I think that's nice for a mathematician to teach. And you like teaching both undergraduates and graduates? Yes, yes. And you know, I know that you've had several, you know, uh, a series of graduate students since you... You, you know, know, when we teach calculus, 
in a way, we teach the greatest mathematics ever invented. Absolutely. <laughs> and I can come to the students and introduce them to, to the work of Newton. Well, I want to thank you for, for spending this time with us because, and, and thank you for coming to UCSD. I know that, that both the administration and the math department are so excited to have you, but uh, it was a joy to talk to you today, and, and, and uh, I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad you're in this office, and we hope that you're going to be here for a long time.